uh, we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everybody to our first annual Forbes School of Business and Technology STEM Day. And we're supported by some of the other colleges within Ashford University, which you'll hear from later on today. But to start us off on schedule, I'd like to introduce our keynote speaker for the day. It's Mr. Mark Mills. Mark's on the East Coast, so it's already noon there. And I promised him that we would be able to get him back to work soon. So you probably all have his biography on the website, but I'll touch on some of the highlights. Mark is a senior fellow at the Manhattan Institute and a partner in Cotton Venture Partners, which is a digital oil field venture fund. He's also a faculty fellow at the McCormick School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Northwestern University. Mark writes for several different publications. He's a Forbes contributor, which is where I got to know Mark. And uh, most importantly, I think for Forbes School of Business and Technology, Mark is one of our very valued members of our board of advisors. So Mark was just out in San Diego, in Torrey Pines, actually, La Jolla, uh, just about a week ago, I think it was, Mark, uh, for our meeting out there. He also was a speaker at the uh, Forbes Thought Leadership Summit. So I want to thank you for those, and I want to thank you for being here. Mark, why don't we go ahead and get started? You've got a really interested, interesting subject today. Thanks, Ken, and uh, thanks for inviting me to... Uh join you and, uh, and talk to everybody. Uh, let me, uh, I'm gonna use some slides. Uh, let me just say briefly first by way of introduction that uh, as Ken said, you could all find my biography online, of course. You may have already read the long version at my website, you know, it's tech-pundit.com. And uh, pretty much everything I've written the last decade is up there chronologically, relatively easy to figure out. I've, I've spent my life, just so you know, uh, in a sort of couple of domains, uh, and I still do. I do a lot of work in, um, in public policy. Uh, as a senior fellow, I testify before the Congress and Senate occasionally. Uh, I write about tech and energy policy. I also, as Ken mentioned, I'm a partner in a tech venture fund. We invest in software, uh, primarily for the uh, energy industry and oil and gas industry, uh, because uh, it's a big industry where there are not enough people making investments. I spent a lot of my life as uh, early on as a scientist, as an engineer, uh, ran uh, small factory. I worked in a big factory for semiconductors. Uh, I worked you in a way for a long time ago. So, you know, I've been on both sides of the equation, so to speak. And I, I guess if I were going to summarize what I like to think that I am and do is I'm a technology forecaster. So with that, what I want to do is talk to you about, and I'm going to put some slides up now, uh, the technologies of uh, automation. And uh, you can see uh, what, my, what I think about the thesis here in the title of my presentation. The thesis being that automation, artificial intelligence, and robots, more broadly speaking, uh, mean the end of work. You know, you've, you've been reading this. You've been hearing a lot about what automation means, both in the terms of artificial intelligence and as, in terms of uh, manufacturing, that somehow this combination now means that we're facing the end of work. So... I'm going to talk broad, broadly about this thesis. Uh, the reason I think it may have some relevance for you is that as you think about what you'd like to do, what you plan to do in the future, uh, it's important, to, I think, to have the right framework of where the world's going, and particularly the United States. Uh, let, put it this way, simplistically, if, uh, if you're thinking about a future uh, as an entrepreneur or in work in the age of the horse and buggy, to use the obvious simplistic example, and it was the dawn of the age of the automobile, it would be kind of a mistake to get into the coach works for making uh, carriages for horses and buggies. Although I will point out as a matter of historic fact, Fisher Auto Body, which makes uh, the bodies for General Motors cars, is one of the only companies that survived from the age of the horse. They made the bodies for carriages in the horse and buggy era. So it's possible to survive <laughs> from one era to the next. Anyway, that aside, let, let's talk about this thesis. And and you, you you've doubtless read about it, heard about it, people talk about it a lot, that the future of work now is, uh, look at the bottom of the slide, uh, this is uh, typical of what's being said. There's a new report out from Gallup, and uh, you know, economists all agree, right? This is a warning sign for those of you who uh, look at forecasting. It's rarely the case uh, that 
when economists agree about technology that they're right. That's just a bias on my part, a physicist. In any case, they're good at looking at the past and models and short-term microeconomics. On the macro stories, we're going to talk about not so good. But anyway, economists agree the single biggest threat to the future of job growth in the U.S. is the surge of artificial intelligence. This is a uh, this this was a uh, survey done by Gallup earlier this year. I. I just want to remind you that uh, we've been here before, or, or to put it differently, we've seen this movie before. Uh, the top of your slide, you see a couple of pictures. Uh, one of them you might recognize from history books. That's a IBM mainframe circa 1960. And the picture on your right is the first industrial robot put into practical use uh, in, the in 1961. That's a Unimate, uh, went on an automobile production line and it was, everybody was so amazed by it that the founder, who's in the background, went on the Johnny Carson show. This is not a great picture because there aren't many great photographs that I could find, but that's Johnny Carson in the foreground. So the late night talk show King was featuring a robot as a guest on the show. And that was because around that time, then President Kennedy uh, gave a, a, a message to Congress in a speech where he said that he thought that the major domestic challenge of the 1960s was to ensure full employment when automation was replacing, of course, he said men, not people. That was the 60s. Uh, and he formed a commission to look at the impact of automation on employment. And uh, so did President Johnson afterwards, and they uh, all reached the same conclusion. Uh, the experts thought that the jobs were going to disappear. Because as a calibration point, 60% of the kinds of jobs that existed in 1960 don't exist today. Maybe sound obvious. There are no typing pools. There are no draftsmen really anymore. All kinds of jobs like that. But we're, as, as many of you uh, doubtless know, keeping track of the news, we're at full employment now. So obviously something happened. All the jobs didn't go away. What happened was a common story and a reality of how economies function since the Industrial Revolution. So this is a, this is a, a time series uh, of two key, two key facts that have in it buried another fact from 1890 to date from uh, for which we have good data. Uh, over that long time period, if you think about that 130 year time period, there have been, this is sort of obvious, profound gains in technology, profound changes in technology. The productivity of the US economy has improved radically, put differently. Uh, the number of uh, labor hours needed to make a product have declined astonishingly. The number of labor hours to make a car from 1900 to 1920 dropped 700%. The number of labor hours from 1910 to 1930 to make a ton of steel dropped 400%. Every industry had the same characteristic from the 19th century through to today. So productivity is just a synonym in economics for reducing the number of inputs, labor hours and materials to get the same output. In other words, if technology that improves productivity were destroying jobs on a net basis, what you'd expect to see is unemployment would have been rising for the last 130 years. Instead, unemployment, as you can see in the red line, has been oscillating around 5% for that 130 years. Put differently, 95% of people who looked for a job found a job for 130 years, even though the number of labor hours needed to do something was being radically reduced for 130 years. The result of productivity is to increase wealth, and so what you see is the green line, the average wealth per capita has soared over that time. That's what technology does. That's what automation does. This is an automation story. That's what's happened for 130 years. What you're being told now, what you're hearing now, is the claim that this time it's different. This time, the technology of automation, robots, artificial intelligence, high-performing high, high uh, machine automation, all these things are different than what occurred in the past. Well, let's just talk about what's different. Of course it's different in this sense. Robots today are different. Robots, is, of course, is just a popular, poorly defined term for automation. Uh, a washing machine is a robot, right? People used to wash clothes by hand. Uh, uh, so automatic washing machine, it was called an automatic washing machine, an automated washing machine for a reason. In fact, you know, the car was called an automobile for the same reason. It was an automated way of mobility instead of having to walk or to... Uh, Ride, you know, ride a horse. So what do, what do we mean by automation? Now let's have a taxonomy of what's different, because what's important here is not, is, is to keep clear in, in, uh, in our mind this taxonomy problem. 
It's not that the technologies aren't different. Of course they're different. They're different every time. Engineers always invent different things. Entrepreneurs always invent new and different things. The key question is, is whether the effect of the different thing is different. Is the effect of automation different now? Obviously, the things that are driving automation are different. So the, the word robot really defines two classes of automation, mechanical automation, if you like, at the highest levels, you know, C-3PO and, and Star Trek. The robot on your right is the Boston Dynamics Atlas robot, which is an anthropomorphic robot like C-3PO. The robot on the left, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, may have you, many of you may be, that's from Boston Dynamics, that's Spot Mini. Spot Mini apparently is, they claim, the company claims they're gonna start selling it next year. If you haven't seen a YouTube video of Spot Mini in action, I highly recommend looking, looking at the video. It's a, an impressive robot. Those two classes of robots are what people typically have in their heads when we say robots and automation. Those kinds of robots are not very common. They, uh, they, don't, uh, they don't exist, you can't buy them. Uh, they, they don't exist, they don't exist in commerce. They don't exist in a way that you can go out and buy this business. So the robots that people really mean are the uh, machines that are very sophisticated versions of the 1961 Unimate. The other class of robots is the invisible robot, the artificial intelligence in the cloud. That's obviously a, a Alexa that you're looking at the, at the bottom. And that really is a robot. Now, you can't pick things up, but you can talk to it. And it has a reasonably accurate response uh, artificial intelligence engine, as does Siri, as does uh, Google. Uh, all of them have reasonably good, not great in my opinion, uh, artificial intelligence engines that function essentially like a robot does. The robots that matter today are not the anthropomorphic robots walking around looking like C-3PO. They're what I would call the, art, the code in the cloud, artificial intelligence that resides in data centers and that you can access by talking to your, to your uh, handheld or you can't talk to your uh, smartwatch yet, but that will come. The other kind of robot that is meaningful today in manufacturing, I would call the code in the cobot. Some of you may have heard this uh, uh, term cobot, which is a collaborative robot, robots that work with people that don't replace them. Then the top, that's an automotive manufacturing line, obviously with both people and robots. In the bottom right, you see the Da Vinci medical robot. So I, 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 I'll talk another time about how soon we'll see anthropomorphic robots like C-3PO. It's going to be a while. They're pretty difficult to build. They're very expensive. Atlas probably is in the $2 million a piece range. In uh, relative terms, that's about uh, 10 times more expensive than the first car in the 1890s, which cost a couple of hundred thousand dollars in today's, today's dollars. So let's talk about uh, where robots live. The robots that really matter that are changing the world, of course, are the virtual robots, the artificial intelligence. And that, that has some relevant relevance in this sense. If we're looking to think about the kinds of businesses that are being created, the kinds of businesses where you can work or the kind of businesses you can create. The most common thing you're hearing about are things like Uber, you know, Google Mapping, Waze, uh, machine learning that can look at x-rays and help doctors figure out whether something is a tumor or not. Um, all the classes of uh, things that are going on for disintermediation, quote, of old businesses. Use vir virtual robots, use artificial intelligence, use ar uh, algorithms in the cloud. Those, those computers live in things that you know, call data centers. And, uh, oh, I, I oh, this is, you get the, uh, I'm babysitting the dog as well today, so. We'll, uh, we'll get going here again, I, I, <laughs> I'm sorry. So the, uh, the biggest data center in the world is, the, uh, is in, uh, outside of Reno, Nevada. It's a picture of the Switch data center. It, it, is, uh, it is a massive building, like a giant warehouse. In fact, that Google calls them warehouse scale computers. And this, uh, this building has more square feet under its roof than the world's tallest skyscraper, which of course is the, uh, the Burj in uh, Dubai. The, uh, the world of data centers is uh, incredible and visible to most people who are familiar with it. There's about 1,500 skyscrapers in the world. Uh, that are you know, like the Empire State Building class of building. There are 5,000 data centers in the world that are like this switch data center. Each of those house hundreds of thousands of computers running constantly. That's what the cloud is. That's where artificial intelligence resides. That's where machine learning really resides. That's what's animating this next generation of artificial intelligence and businesses and business opportunities. Now, from a viewpoint of the 
forecasting what difference all this can make to industries and businesses and how it can animate the opportunity for work or creating new classes of uh, businesses entirely. Remember, nobody thought of an Amazon as a business until there was an internet. And no one thought of an Uber until there was an internet with supercomputing cloud capacity combined with a real-time geolocation and a computer in your pocket, the smartphone. So there are an entirely new class of businesses like that that will eventually emerge in every business as more businesses start to use software, information technologies. This is a key fact that for you to all to have in mind about where the future is going. This is the percentage of expenses that these classes of businesses spend on IT. What you'll see from this is that most businesses, in fact, if you look at the everything from the top five down, if you exclude the top five, 90% of the economy, 90% of the GDP is comprised of businesses that are in those industries where the average amount of money being spent in information technology is only one to two or three percent. As those businesses start to spend more money on algorithms, on software, they'll become more productive, they'll become more Uber-like, if you like, more Amazon-like, and they'll hire more people because more productivity means more wealth. More wealth means that they have to expand, they have no choice. The nature of the jobs, by the way, in those industries aren't necessarily going to be jobs for coders. They will be jobs for people who understand what information technology is. To understand what information technology is, obviously you have to study it, but you don't have to be a coder or an engineer to get a job in Google. Now, Google has a lot of coders, but 90% of their employees are not coders. And this is true of every industry from, from the Hewlett Packard. I like coders. I used to write code in the back in the dawn of time, but it's not the, it's not the only path to having a job or creating a company associated with uh, IT. The key point on this graph is to think about how much room there is for growth and the expansion of the use and utilization of artificial intelligence in essentially every sector of the economy. Another way to measure this growth and the future of uh, employment and the, the, dy the, the dynamic change in the nature of, of how we are structuring industries, and by that I mean how they, how they can function, become more productive, is looking at what Cisco calls the, uh, the zettabyte era. The zettabytes, all of you know what bytes are, kilobytes, megabytes, and gigabytes of storage and, and uh, information trans transfer capacity. The total accumulative amount of uh, data on the world's networks is measured in zettabytes, a much bigger number. And the, uh, the, the, the folks at Cisco track this and look out into the future. We are now in what they call the zettabyte era. The zettabyte era, of course, we have um, a lot of traffic. It's, um, in fact, to, to give you a, a sense of perspective, the traffic on the internet today in an hour is greater than all of the traffic on the internet uh, 20 years ago in a year. So traffic has grown a lot. It's gonna grow a lot more yet. What's interesting about where the growth is occurring is that it's going to be in areas that haven't had a lot of information technology embedded into it to date. Where the spending has been very low, as the spending rises, you'll start seeing more business IT, more uh, supply chain IT, more healthcare IT. So it won't all be in entertainment and social media. Entertainment and social media are gonna grow dramatically. In fact, will grow something on the order of 20 fold. But what you see is in this graph is that the growth and everything else is even bigger. If you want to think about a roadmap of uh, where, where would I, if I were an investor, where would I put my money? If I were an entrepreneur, where would I look at it, at getting involved in the uh, future of robotics as it impacts different industries? Or if I were looking for a job uh, and think of what kind of industry would be interesting to work in where there's a dynamic change coming with respect to the uh, application of robots, with, again, as you know, by now I mean both artificial intelligence and actually the physical automation systems. This is a, uh, a map produced by CB Insights where they looked at where venture capitalists are investing money today in robotics. Uh, this, doesn't, this doesn't tell you uh, where robots are being used today. This tells you where venture capitalists at least think there's an opportunity, far more opportunity and growth for robots to be used in the, in the future. It also gives you a sense of, because remember, venture capitalists don't think in terms of 20-year timelines. I say that because I'm a venture capitalist as well. You think in terms of uh, not one-year timelines, which is what 
a, a business can do it, or a, if you're an investor in a stock, but you think more in terms of three to five year timelines and maybe seven year timelines, which is very relevant to uh, growth opportunities, again, for, uh, for an entrepreneur, that's why invest, investors invest in those areas, and also for somebody looking for work. You, you'll see in this map, uh, obviously, that the consumer-related automation to, is a, a, big, a big piece of it in the blue, right? But it's not the dominant piece. In fact, one of it, you can see the educational slice, which is a place where Ashford's and the Forbes School of Business and Technology are involved in. That's a big slice. But there's a lot of activity going on in heavy industries, a lot of activities in the medical domains, a lot of activity, in fact, in government domains. By activity, this is real money, tens and hundreds of billions of dollars being invested annually by both venture capitalists and corporations into automating different features of each of these domains. Let me, let me, let me come at it in a different way to give you a, 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 another uh, approach to thinking about the implication of automation in improving productivity, the implication of robots, and where the world is going to be going in the near future with a thought experiment focused around five of the biggest tech companies that exist in the world today. You know who these companies are to, on the left. doesn't require any explanation. But here's the thought experiment. If, um, you know, you all know Amazon bought uh, Whole Foods. Every, almost everybody knows that who follows these fields. Uh, why did Amazon buy Whole Foods? Well, obviously, right? They, they have uh, a, a powerful artificial intelligence driven web-based uh, mechanism for connecting sellers and buyers. They have one of the most efficient supply chain distribution mechanisms in the world, right? and they want to grow. And they've grown from books to where they are today, but where do you go next? Well, they went to food. What would they do next? So this is the thought experiment to tell you something about um, where the world's going to go, where jobs might be, where technology might be. But this is just, you know, humor me here. What, what would you do if you're Amazon? Remember, they have a trillion dollar market cap. So they could, they could go somewhere next by buying another company like a Whole Foods. Well, Amazon's a very good distribution company, but they, they count on contractors like UPS and FedEx. One place you could go next, since the world is always going to require distribution, is to buy FedEx outright. Just to buy it, like they bought Whole Foods. The numbers in parentheses are the market cap, for those of you who know it. Let me, let me explain what market cap means for those of you who don't follow in the investment world. The market cap is the value of the company today in dollars as seen by its stock price today. So obviously that's not its revenue. It's almost always, if it's a successful company, far higher than its actual revenue. Uh, unsuccessful companies obviously have a market value below their revenues because that means investors don't have confidence the company has a future. Your market cap for Amazon is far more than its revenue and a trillion dollars because investors think it's gonna be worth a lot more in the future. So you can use your market cap your stock to buy other companies. Amazon has a market cap of a trillion, Apple almost a trillion, Google like 600 billion, Microsoft I think it's seven or 800 billion now. These are all huge market cap companies. So they could buy FedEx or they could buy a company that many of you may never have heard of, Tila. This is an Israeli company that manufactures generic pharmaceuticals. So after a pharmaceutical comes off of patent, uh, then, you, then anybody can make it, uh, as long as they get FDA approval if they're doing it right and then they can sell it. Amazon, as you know, has also got the drug distribution business, the pharma, pharma, pharmaceutical distribution business. One way to go uh, the next stage and in bringing uh, information technology into that business is to own one of the businesses. Let's look at Apple. What has Apple done? Some of you know its new Apple Watch, the latest Apple Watch, uh, has an EKG feature on it. It can actually get approved by the uh, Food and Drug Administration that will allow you to take medical, basically self take self, uh, don't go to the doctor, do an EKG. That's kind of interesting. Uh, I think what this tells you is that Apple has a desire to get much more involved, not just in the app feature of health information, but ultimately into a very specific medically relevant health information. What would you buy if you're Apple and you wanted to have the equivalent of a smartphone embedded in people? Well, you'd buy Medtronic, which is a medical device manufacturer, one of the best in the world. They're the ones that make things like pacemakers and all kinds of implanted medical electronics. Uh, that might sound sort of spooky. Uh, it's really not, uh, especially if some of the uh, devices uh, are what we'll call biodegradable and digestible. You can imagine a future, technologies already exist, where you could have what I would call consumable computers. You, uh, your vitamin pill contains 
in it a digestible smart sensor that provides biological information about you personally, securely tied to your, in this case, smartphone. And um, you can use that for medical tracking when you go see your doctor. Apple might also, uh, you know, people talk a lot about the future of cars. Uh, instead of starting a car company, Apple could buy one of the world's best automotive manufacturers that you've never heard of. It's a company called Magna. Magna is a Canadian company. Magna manufactures the BMW 5. They're a contract manufacturer. They make the new BMW i3. They make all kinds of extremely uh, high performance, high end automobiles, but without a brand name on it. They're the behind the scenes um, uh, contract manufacturer. If you're Apple and you want to have an Apple car, uh, you could buy Magna, let them keep making BMWs with the BMW label and, and design an entirely new kind of car and not have any of the headaches that Elon Musk has had in trying to make a, to make a, a company that can manufacture cars. If you got a trillion dollar market cap, just buy Magna. Google, I think, because it, they're the, they're, they like to think of themselves and think correctly as the uh, tech leaders uh, of the computing world, the logical acquisitions are IBM and Hewlett Packard for their supercomputers. Microsoft, which is obviously a software company. Logical acquisitions are these companies. SAP is another enterprise software company, but the interesting one I put here for you to think about is Roche, which is a pharmaceutical research development product, product company. Pharmaceuticals are increasingly being designed by supercomputers. Uh, there, you, you have the experiments, the design done in, in, in virtual reality first before you do them in real reality, so to speak. If you really want to get into that business and own the future of next generation therapeutics and the software that drives it, maybe you buy that company. I throw Facebook in here just for fun because they get about their future and all the controversy about the news uh, issues around Facebook. As well, if, you, if you're going to be viewed as a news organization, why not buy the world's biggest uh, news organization, Thomas Reuters, Thompson, Thompson Reuters. Uh, and if you want better distribution, which they, they, they do, as you know, they've done all kinds of things like experiment with with drones and high altitude uh, solar powered planes to make sure the internet can get around the world, just buy Sirius. They got a satellite network already launched. The point of all this is to give you a sense uh, in two ways. These, the industries on your left are all IT industries. The industries on your right, many of them are hardware industries. Those two worlds are merging. They may merge even faster than has happened in the past because of the money that exists on the left side of the equation and because of the opportunity that exists to really make more money with the industries on the right side of this equation. Let me finish with this last slide and then I'm happy to take questions that maybe get to either more specifics about where the future of work is or more specifics about some technologies. This is a, a slide uh, that is kind of self-explanatory, but let me, as they say, there's no such thing. Let me explain it. Uh, we think about our, our country and the development of technologies uh, at the big sort of macro level is creating new kinds of infrastructures. Highways are an infrastructure. The, the, the invention of the highway itself goes back to Roman times, but the modern highway system that we have, the interstate highway system, was built specifically to facilitate con commerce, and it did. So if you read what uh, President Eisenhower said and wrote at the time when they signed the bill to create the interstate highway system, uh, the whole idea was that this would accelerate commerce and, and make America wealthier a place and also a place where people have more fun, you go on vacations more easily, all those kinds of things. So over the years, there's, there have been a, some very specific new classes of infrastructures that have been created by engineers and built out and they've changed the world. Uh, the y-axis tells you the point in time in which the, the, the uh, infrastructure went from non-existent to 100% penetration. So canals, right, didn't really exist in America until just after the uh, the Revolutionary War, and they were 100% built out by about 1850, halfway in 1835. So you can see what's what's shown here, telegraph and railroads. Uh, we haven't really got the 100% built out for the aviation system. We were halfway in 2000, and we've got more, as you all know, if you travel, we, we need to build more airports yet, have uh, more uh, corridors for air traffic. The two newest infrastructures are the ones we've just been talking about. The cloud, the infrastructure, the cloud, its data centers and the wireless networks. That infrastructure, is, we're not even 20% into building it. And it is, I think, going to build out roughly as fast as previous infrastructures. All these look like they were growing pretty fast. That, that's extremely bullish for all the industries that, that it animates and that it accelerates. 
And then the area that I will call um, in the more traditional C3PO kind of language, the real anthropomorphic class of robots, I think we'll get those. Uh, that's self-driving cars, if you like, uh, in some respects, and uh, robots like Spot Mini. That one starts later. It's harder to do. It's much more expensive. That's the next era. But if I were betting on as an investor or betting a, as an entrepreneur or betting on places to, to work where there's a lot of velocity, it would be in this new so-called cloud infrastructure. So with that, uh, let me stop and uh, invite uh, any questions that anybody might have. Mark, thank you. That, this is Ken again. Um, if anybody has questions, would you please put them in the chat and I will relay them to Mark in the event that he can't see them. So please, questions on any of this, any other things that can concern you about the new technologies and what effect it may have on your future, especially on your, your education if you're students with us. And of course, I should add any questions that anyone has about anything they like on technology, well, robotics, venture capital, uh, entrepreneurship. Uh, obviously, these are things I am interested in, work in, and care about as well. Hey, Mark, this is Kate. I had a quick question for you. Um, uh, sorry, I'm the host, but just a... <laughs> um, uh, I'm, I'm interested. Um, you were kind of talking about how... Uh, many people sort of focus on coding as a way to um, get into technology. Um, why do you think that there's such a draw to that and maybe in, um, um, in, in lieu of going into the other, um, the other types of technology uh, professionally? And you said that you kind of started out, you know, doing some coding. How did your journey change from, from doing that into where you are now? Well, that's, that's a good question. Uh, let me, and by the way, let me apologize to everybody again for my feral dog that uh, this is the, the good and bad of uh, net, networked systems <laughs> live with what's on the other end. So uh, let me say this first that uh, those who like to code and those who like uh, writing software, uh, there's a, obviously a lot of opportunity because there's currently a shortage of uh, coders. Uh, so that's good. I mean, that's, a, that's not, not nothing. Uh, and so I, anyone that, that has those appetites, I, I certainly encourage them to pursue it. There, there's plenty of work for them. Uh, the other side, though, of the equation is important is for those who actually don't like it, uh, aren't particularly good at it, and they're afraid that that's really the only path for, for work in the tech industry. So I, I'll throw out a factoid that's kind of helpful to keep in mind. Uh, we have a big economy, but as it stands today, the percentage of the workforce that works in coding is roughly the same percentage of the workforce that actually work on farms. Uh, just to, to calibrate, that doesn't mean they're both important, right? I mean, we need farmers because we need food and we need coders because they're basically the, the, uh, the, the, the nervous, the, the backbone of, the, of computing systems that we need. So, we will need more coders. There's a shortage. Uh, it doesn't. It, it, it. You don't even have to understand how code works per se, but you have to understand how how the code functions, what it does, and why it does what it does, to I think be um, engaged directly in a tech industry these days. And that doesn't mean that you have to understand and look at the code on the screen the way you see it uh, show up when a coder uh, is operating, but rather that you understand what it is that it can do and can't do, it's realistic. It, you know this intuitively, by the way, most people who are sophisticated about their own computers and smartphones, you're using code. I mean, you understand what it can and can't do. Uh, you can drill a layer deeper and uh, figure out a little more, but you don't have to be a coder. So specifically though, let me say uh, this about uh, what I would, if I were, in my, sort of my journey, so I didn't code because I wanted to become a coder. I did it because it was something I thought I needed to understand. But it was kind of like taking a math class. If you could take a math class, doesn't mean you're going to be a mathematician. Uh, and you could take a math class if you're an English major. A lot of English majors, uh, you know, try and try math out, may not like it. But it, it it helps you understand the framework of thinking for how math works, which is essentially how coding works. There's a very good uh, program for freshmen at Northwestern University, and it may, there may be one ask for it. I'm embarrassed to say I don't know this. So I should know. And the, the coding is taught for freshmen who are not engineering students, but it's taught as a language. 
It's not taught as a, a computer science course because it's essentially understanding the language of how computers communicate amongst themselves. So it's a very successful course because it allows students to get a picture of how computers operate without feeling like they have to emerge becoming a coder. And I think you can do some of this, by the way. You can self-learn this by uh, reading books written for non-experts about how, you know, how coding functions. Fabulous, thank you. We have a question in the chat here. Um, construction was at the bottom of your graph for automation. I understand that a lot of money from venture capital is moving into this area. MIT is doing a lot of research in construction automation. What will be the timeline before it makes an impact in the construction industry and how will that change this industry? That's a, that's a good observation. I mean, construction and uh, the oil and gas industry are, uh, are, are very manpower intensive. They're very similar, in, in fact. So, so it's already having an impact, but it has an impact first on the information side, the virtual robot side. So put it this way, if you, you can imagine one of the challenges in the construction trades is that there are a lot of people who have uh, skills that you need, but you need episodically, trying to, to, to connect people with uh, capabilities, something to sell, their, their, their talent or their product, with the people doing the building. It's a perfect place for an Uber-like, Airbnb-like platform. So those kinds of platforms already exist. There's one called RigUp, R-I-G-U-P, and RigUp uh, 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 operates a lot like, it look, if you go to it, it looks very familiar, it operates a lot like an Uber kind of platform. So that, that's already happening. That's already helping improve uh, the velocity of getting the right you know, workers that you need at the at job site. It also helps the people who are selling the product or service to get to a, uh, a task. Then, then the next challenge is how do I automate some of the actual construction process itself? That's much more difficult, just like all robots are more difficult. That's also beginning. There's a, a bricklaying robot. If you, again, go to YouTube and, and uh, search around, you can find a video of it. So bricklayers are hard to come by. You don't actually have enough bricklayers. Uh, it's one of those trades where you could argue that uh, most people don't choose to go into it. There's a, a choice between, uh, I'll just pick an example. I, was, I worked as, I did some bricklaying when I was young. I worked as an electrician and a mechanic, a machinist and a welder going through school. If I had to choose between laying bricks and doing a, a plumbing, I'd take plumbing in a heartbeat just because for obvious reasons. Anyway, uh, some, ta some t mechanical tasks like bricklaying are a little easier to automate than other tasks uh, are in the, in the construction industry, but that's already beginning. And then the other uh, thing that's beginning to happen is a, what I'll call a pseudo form of automation. People in construction business have talked for a long time of modular construction. You pre-build things in a, in a factory and you build it, you design it so that it can be transported easily and you design it so it can be assembled easily at the other end. That sounds trivial, it's trivially easy to do, but that design process is extraordinarily difficult. Modern supercomputers, you can rent time in the cloud for, for a song, allow that design process now to essentially automate, semi-automate the design process to lead to a semi-automated prefab and assembly process that goes on on site. So that's beginning. So it's starting now. Uh, you, you're, the, the question the question is correct. If there's a lot of uh, venture capital starting to go there now, and it's going there now precisely because uh, the computer computers are, are finally powerful enough and cheap enough to allow that class of automation to begin. Probably the most the most important uh, single feature of construction trade automation is going to be what's true of the entire industrial sector, which is the supply chain part of it. Thanks, Mark. We've got another one. What type of educational preparation should we be offering students in our high schools and universities? Um, and then a follow-up question to that, do you see the study of liberal arts diminishing? Well, great questions. Uh, for those of you who are interested in this, I've written about both um, a lot. Uh, I've co-authored pieces with my, one of my sons who is a PhD in philosophy philosophy of science, and he is gainfully employed, I'm happy to say. But uh, so uh, two, two parts. Let's, we have to define what we mean by liberal arts. Uh, so by liberal arts, to me, that means uh, English literature, history, writing, uh, music, all the philosophy, all the, uh, the specific disciplines that are classic liberal arts. Uh, we haven't had a majority of people in college taking we haven't had a significant number of people taking liberal arts educations for 
better part of half a century. So if you track the data, it's available. Uh, at peak, I believe we're under 10% of college students took what would be called a liberal arts degree. Defined the way I describe it, it was an English literature degree or a, um, a degree in philosophy. So they're a minor, it's always been a minority. It's now, I think, down to a few percent. So it's dropped it's by threefold, but it's, it's never been a, uh, a significant major. I think that uh, it's extremely important. I think that what you'll, you, for a whole lot of reasons, not least of which, and by the way, what I'm saying applies also to, to high schools, uh, and it applies even more to high schools. I think it's a mistake to think that what we should teach students in high school is to become, everybody to become an engineer or a technician. First of all, not everybody's gonna become an engineer or a technician. We don't need everybody to be an engineer or a technician. Only 11% of the workforce are engineers, by the way, engineers and scientists. We're not gonna have half the workforce being engineers and scientists ever, in my, in my view. So we have to be careful about how, what we think we're doing. On two, two counts, first is that since not everybody's gonna become an engineer, training everyone to become one is a mistake. Secondly, tra everybody, as Google has discovered, the, the talents that matter that lead to career advancement aren't the technical talents. So probably some of you know this, and you can again find this online. You can Google it, no pun intended. The, uh, Google did a massive study to look at their employee, employees to see who they were promoting and what their skills were, because they obviously have a big workforce with managers who promote people up. And what they discovered, and you won't be surprised when I say this, Dallas, you've been told this from teachers to parents, that the, the most common characteristics of the people succeeded in Google were people who were flexible, who listened, who were creative, who were, uh, if, you, if you, you know where I'm going with this, they were, they were talents that weren't related to that they were math whizzes. Doesn't mean the math whizzes didn't do, do well if they were geniuses, just met on average, the employees that were promoted the most and went the furthest, were most useful to Google, had all these soft, so-called soft talents, which are most, more closely uh, uh, associated with the quote, liberal, liberal arts. So I was a huge fan when I, of trying to uh, encourage engineers and scientists to take liberal arts courses, and in fact, have universities require them. Uh, I took as many as I could when I was in school. They weren't, it wasn't easy because the faculty didn't make it easy for us to do that. So I don't, I don't, uh, now with the future of the liberal arts, I think, um, I guess I'm optimistic. I think that we, we are slowly rediscovering after a, a period of 20 or 30 years where we thought they were irrelevant. We're slowly rediscovering that they're important for, for mental and intellectual development for social reasons. Uh, and I think we're also rediscovering this single fact, and I'll, I'll end with, uh, we, I'm a forecaster. I, have a, I think I have a pretty good idea of the framework of technologies that will exist in the future. What we don't know are the nature of business that will exist to use those technologies. So in that sense, we can't predict the future and what kind of specific skills we need. So teaching highly specific skills to everybody is a mistake. The minority that wanna take a highly specific skill like coding will do just fine. But most people don't wanna do that and they don't know what they really wanna do when they uh, finish school and they want to be capable of being adaptable, and that's what the employers want. Wonderful. We've got a couple more questions here in the chat. Uh, the grocery industry and Amazon, what are your future forecasts in that industry, five to ten years uh, specifically for Amazon? Um, oh, there's a, a whole bunch of questions here. Um, how that's much right. share of market can they gain? Yeah. What do you suggest that retailers in this industry do to that threat? How do market leaders defend their market share? Okay. You can take them one at a time if you'd like. I can come back on and say them well, again. <laughs> the, the Amazon specific forecast is a challenge. Uh, that's sort of what you, what you would ask an invest, uh, you know, an invest uh, investor, investment investment pundit. And uh, sometimes I uh, I play one on TV for those. <laughs> so I think Amazon can can do a lot better and will do a lot better and will become a, a force in this because they have a head start over a lot of uh, a lot of people. Uh, Walmart, as you, as many of you may know, have uh, really caught up a lot on their use of the internet and uh, AI and network connectivity to uh, have a highly efficient business. They don't have the same cachet that Amazon does. So Amazon is not alone in their ability to do, the, do these things. Uh, I think it, it's going to be interesting to see how they do in groceries. I think it's a, it's, I suspect they'll do well. 
Uh, it's much more challenging for a lot of reasons that we all know uh, than uh, uh, functioning as an as intermediary, shipping somebody else's product in, in the form of hardware. Once you start shipping consumable goods like that, much more challenging. Uh, they're smart people. I expect they do well. The, what market share could they get? Well, look, uh, we know that Whole Foods, I think Whole Foods market share, if I remember correctly, they're below 1% of the grocery industry, as I, if I think. I've, they're, in, they're in their, they're either just sub single digits or low single digit percentage. I apologize, I've forgotten. I could Google it as, as we keep saying, but they're, they're, so that would tell you that if they do well, and I think they will do well, uh, they could get more market share. Uh, how much should they get? Well, look, I guess I would, if I were picking a boundary condition, I suspect they can't go higher on that industry than they do in general on online retail. As you all know, Amazon is uh, half of online retail, but it's only, online retail is currently only 8% of total retail. So put differently, that means Amazon is about uh, two to 3% of total retail. Could they become, uh, could they double their, their market share in, in groceries? I, I think that's perfectly respectable to believe or triple it, but that would make them the dominant grocer in the country, it just would make them a very successful grocer. What do, what do, other, uh, what do the other companies do? Well, they do what uh, they compete. Uh, and if they don't compete well, offering the, the particular benefits that Amazon platform offers, which is transparency, speed, convenience, with high quality, then they'll probably go bankrupt, right? That's what happens eventually. It takes time. These things don't have a, a very short timeline, uh, but you already see that. You already see that going on. I mean, you saw this early on with uh, many grocers, some of the bigger ones like Giant, uh, started uh, online ordering and delivery. Uh, they're pretty good at it. I don't know if they're as good as Amazon necessarily, but they're pretty good. So I, I think what you'll see are businesses that will increasingly appear that are uh, the service industries that will sell their capacity, their capability to the grocers. So Amazon bought a grocery company. The grocery companies can buy a service. We'll call it, uh, you know, you, you know the expressions, you know, software as a service, you know, construction as a service. Groceries as a service is an industry that can create itself with a platform that can rent the platform to other grocery companies. So I suspect that's what will happen because it's a huge industry. And in dollar terms, uh, buying food and buying gasoline are roughly co-equal. I mean, fueling our cars and fueling ourselves are about the same size of industries. So they're pretty big. Great. Um, there's a question around uh, uh, pay in tech at Amazon, but maybe you can talk about pay in tech. Uh, obviously, a very broad and far-reaching question, but um, you know, what what's sort of the outlook for you know s sustainable income? Um, in the tech industry? Well, it's, a, it's an interesting problem because it is um, the question probably, uh, what's underlying the question I suspect are two features of it. First, if you're the employer, the amount of money you have to pay people in Silicon Valley is starting to feel like it might be unsustainable, which is why a lot of Silicon Valley companies are looking to have offices and, play, and uh, businesses elsewhere. I think it's not the only motivation for Amazon's search for a new headquarters, but it's related to it. Google has offices in New York instead of just Silicon Valley, as everybody knows. Uh, so if you have to, you know, it's great if you're the, not so great if you, if you get double a salary, but you go to an area that costs three times as much. Things that go on from the viewpoint of the sort of the employer employee. the top salaries at, it, because employers really don't want to pay that much money. This expand in the rest of the country. As other businesses become uh, such internet businesses, they'll have to pay more. So there'll be a, a bit of a, a push towards the middle, right? The, the, the super salaries, except for the highest performers in any industry, uh, will get tugged down and the bottom will be tugged up. So that, that put differently, it means that jobs in, in Kansas City will be paid more because if you wanna keep tech talent there, you're gonna have to pay up. And by tech talent, again, I'll say again, not, not necessarily a coder or an engineer, the people who are tech savvy uh, that might just do marketing work inside of, uh, for Google. If you, if Google has offices all over the country. This will be true, not just for the tech companies, 
but for the smaller companies that sell services to the non-tech companies, smaller tech companies that sell tech services to non-tech companies, non-tech grocers again. Okay, and then um, final question. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, when will there be when will there be the transformation of the GB computer versus the Zettabytes computer? Can you go back to the Zettabyte computers? Is that essentially the, the question? I think so. I think the question is really about when we have the next generation of supercomputing, because what we have going on today, Zettabyte's uh, traffic is not a measure of computing power. That's the, that's the measure of the traffic on the highway. I'm, stating, I'm sure the questioner knows this, but for, the, for everybody's benefit, to frame this. Zettabytes and traffic measures how many trucks are and cars on the road. The horsepower uh, that's resonant in the engines of the trucks and the cars determine how fast they can go, how much load they can carry. So the computers are the engines, right? The traffic is what they, what they generate. Uh, we, we're, on the, uh, we're certainly uh, not end, we haven't ended what's called Moore's Law and making computers more powerful. The computers keep getting more powerful, they'll keep getting more powerful yet. It's not a step function yet until we invent something equivalent to something equivalent to inventing the transistor. So we have today's computers are powerful because we went from the vacuum tube era with the invention of the large scale integrated circuit based on hyper small transistors. At some point, a new class of a logic device will be commercially viable. Uh, people talk about quantum computing and probably long before quantum computing, we'll see things like spintronics. There's different classes of uh, semiconductors. What that will enable is uh, supercomputers to become more common, what we call supercomputers today to become more common. But remember, today's smartphone, just to calibrate everybody, you, you've doubtless all heard this, but the smartphone in your, in your pocket or your purse or on your desk, that single smartphone has more than 10,000 times the horsepower of an IBM mainframe from 25 or 30 years ago. So you're carrying around a supercomputer from the, from the perspective of people 25, 30 years ago, ago. That trajectory is not finished. That will take the zettabyte era up to the next uh, prefix for numbers, which is the yottabyte, not Yoda, like in Star Wars, but yottabyte and beyond. Uh, this is, uh, it's hard to imagine what that means. It's kind of like put yourself in 1970 when Intel first came along. Did anybody imagine you could put a computer in your pocket? Well, yeah, a few people did. Arthur C. Clarke did. He was a science fiction writer. There's a video of him you can find on YouTube talking about computers in uh, the 1950s, standing beside a, a, a front of a IBM computer of that day with spinning magnetic tapes going back and forth. You know, you, you see those computers in 1960s cheesy science fiction movies. He said that this computer will shrink down and become more powerful and you'll be able to put it on your desk and eventually in your pocket. What would what, what was the future hold? Well, computers will disappear into the ambient background. You'll, as I said, you'll swallow them. You'll wear them. Wear them as transparent coatings, like a, like an uh, almost an invisible latex glove for haptic feedback to virtual reality. All those things we now know are possible. How fast do they, they come to this next era? I'll call it. I think the question is right. So it's, we'll call it zettabyte computing. You know, uh, probably takes about as long. But that means in a lot of our lifetime, within the next couple of decades, we'll start seeing zettabyte class computing, which will open up uh, new capacities that are uh, arguably as hard to imagine now as imagining an Amazon in 1978. Thank you, Mark. That's, that's where we stop the questions for today to let you get back with your life and <laughs> thank you. Getting the dog. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about the dog. No, that's fine. Um, you know, we, we sincerely appreciate all of your efforts with Ford School of Business and Technology, and it's, of course, what our very first annual STEM Day here today. Uh, for everybody listening, uh, Mark has written numerous articles and books, and they're all available. Just go do that Google search. Uh, I think, Mark, your latest book is Work in the Age of Robots, where a lot of the information you've discussed today can be found and really expanded on. So anybody interested in that topic, go out and find that. I'm sure it's available on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and the usual places. Yep, Amazon it is. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. We appreciate your time and really look forward to working with you in the future. Thanks a lot, Ken. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.